Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game The Flood by Bedouin Games. This game plays two to four players, takes roughly about 30 to 60 minutes to play, and is for ages eight and up. And in the game The Flood, you are playing as the acclaimed Noah from the Bible. Your objective is to build the Ark in time before the Flood hits. You'll be building the Ark and hopefully getting those animals into the Ark so that the Flood doesn't wash away everything, and you'll be able to save all the animals in the world, including you and your family. Throughout the game, you're going to be rolling dice, collecting certain resources that will allow you to build unique caravans vans, locations that will let you gather more resources, a uh, big mammoth that's going to move around the board and gather resources for you, and of course, arc stages, the most important thing in the game. Your objective is to build all the arc stages and then of course get those animals on the arc. And once you've done that, you'll win the game. However, the board is also going to be having unique things happen to it. You'll be drawing these story cards, which is going to have sin cards in them that will move around a tracker throughout the board that is going to eventually make things start flooding, and eventually the entire board will flood and if it floods completely you will lose the game and that's the idea of the game the flood let's take a look at the basic idea of how to set it up and then of course how to play and my review so I normally do a top-down version for the setup for a game, but this one's uh, highly uh, time-consuming. So, and it's going to be reduced and changed a bit in the future, so I don't want to give you an incorrect setup. So what I'm going to do is explain how the game is going to look once you're done. Basically, there is a main game board. That game board is going to encircle the table, and if you're going to have a little circle of circular pieces, there's tiles that you're going to place randomly on the board to fill up the circle. And then you're also going to get little resource tiles that you'll place down in each of the locations, based on the location's resource. Finally, you're going to place a tool in each of the locations that is going to indicate the type of tool that is going to be associated with that resource for the game. Take your token, that is your uh, flood token, place it on the sunny location. I'm using this little camel, but it'll probably be something different for you. After that, the main board is set up. Then you're going to go ahead and take your resources and set them aside into different decks of each of the same resources. So I'll have your water deck, you're going to have your tar deck, you'll have vegetables and bricks and wood, etc., etc., and place that within reach of all players. Then, each player is going to get two player boards. You're going to get your main arc board and, of course, your uh, mammoth slash resource board that you'll be utilizing. Uh, they're going to be randomized, so go ahead and place them next to each other. Uh, and each of the boards are different as well in comparison to each other player. And those boards are going to come along with a certain color of arc. And each of the arcs is going to be different as far as what resources are needed, how many stages are required, and the costs associated with each of the different things that you want to build, whether it be a mammoth, a hut, cargo, trail caravan or a camp. Uh, additionally, you're going to get the resources, or I should say the, the items, for your color. You're going to get your different huts and your different camps. You're going to be getting your different cargo trails and uh, your different caravans. And then you're also going to be getting your arc stages and mammoth. Set aside all of that within reach of yourself so that you can utilize that. And go ahead and take all of your tokens and place them on the tracks of the game board. Place them on, one of your tokens on the four to one trade the one die, to, one die trade for one resource uh, in each of the different locations on this other board here, the cargo trails, the caravans, the huts, and the, man, or, and the camps area. And whenever you're playing with a larger player game, it's going to add different uh, extra um, tokens to these locations. Then, after that, you're going to go ahead and give every single player a player aid. This is going to help you in determining what you do on your turn. Shuffle the story card deck and place it face down next to the board, and take the die and set it within reach of all players. There's going to be two resource die, and there's going to be an item die, or I should say like a tool die. There's also a hut upgrades, there's going to be building point tokens, and other unique little items you can set aside within reach of all players that will be utilized throughout the game as well. After you have done that, you're basically ready to go and set up the game. Uh, or I should say, set up yourself. Each player is going to go around in a clockwise fashion and choose a point of interest with three intersections and place their different arc spaces onto the game board. Make sure you're at least two intersections away from each other player. Once you've gone ahead and placed these guys out, you're basically ready to begin the game, and you're going to start with the first player in order to do the first turn of the round. And your play will proceed from there up until the point where the game ends. So let's go ahead and discuss, now that I've shown you how to set the game up, how to play the game. In the game The Flood, there are two main actions you'll be taking. It's either going to be rolling the dice, gathering resources, and then trading, 
or you're going to be able to buy or build or upgrade one of your pieces and then trade. And it's really up to you what you want to do. In the very beginning of the game, you're most likely going to be rolling the dice. When you roll dice, you'll take all the dice, the two resources and the tool, and you're going to roll them. And then you're going to check the combination of what you get. So it might be a spindle and you might get like uh, tar and bricks, in which case you can look on the board for every spindle and for each location that is associated with that resource. And then any player who is adjacent to that location with either their arc or with a hut or with their camp is going to receive resources. Camps will give you two of that resource, huts will give you one, and your arc will give you one. And you're going to put those into your hand. Additionally, of course, I want to not forget to mention that you'll start with one of each resource into your hand at the beginning of the game. These are what you're going to be utilizing to build, buy, and upgrade. If you choose to go this route with resources, remember that all players will net resources based on your die roll, and it doesn't really matter as far as who's rolling the die, only that your locations are adjacent to that space, similar to games like Catan. There's also going to be a wild space on the main die, which is going to allow you to choose your own tool. And there's going to be card spaces on each of the dice that will associate with drawing story cards, which will present unique things that can happen after resources are gained. Maybe you're going to uh, have some sin happen and you're going to move a marker around the track that's going to slowly push the water um, towards the world. <laughs> or maybe you'll get a merchant. We'll be able to trade five resources to the supply for a one-to-one -one trade. Or perhaps you're going to get Mercy, where you're going to be able to move the tracker backwards, or build a free cargo trail or, or a free caravan. There's a bunch of different cards you can utilize. Some are instant uses, like the Sin or the Mercy one, and others are going to be things that you possibly can save that will let you net you bonuses throughout the game. If you don't want to roll the dice and maybe you want to build, you can do that instead. And when you build, you can choose any of the different upgrades or build actions on your space here, and you'll pay the costs associated. And each of the boards is different. It'll have the different resources on top, then it'll have how many you need, and then of course it'll tell you what it is that you can build or upgrade. You can build mammoths, cargoes, huts, cargo trails, cargo caravans, huts, um, hut upgrades and camps and these are all going to be useful to you just like Catan whenever you build cargo trails you're going to be able to place adjacent to locations that you currently reside at and after you get to at least two spaces away you're going to be able to build things like huts or uh, like camps and you can place them in intersections intersections are the locations in which you're going to be able to use them to get new additional resources throughout the game and it's so what you're going to need to do at the beginning of the game in order to get in the resources that you need. Uh, you're also going to be able to build these uh, longer type trails here. They can kind of work as a two space and you'll be placing them adjacent to the board as well as of course making sure that they are adjacent to at least one of your trails or one of your camps, etc, etc. Um, other things you can do is build your mammoth. Your mammoth will start on your arc location and if you have your mammoth and a space that you can move with him, you'll be able to move to an adjacent location. And then every turn you roll the die, you'll use this action for the mammoth. So you roll the dice, then afterwards you collect the resources, you move your mammoth either onto a space or back onto your arc space. And if you're on a space, you can gather or collect resources. And then of course you can bring them back to your arc to gain a benefit. And each of these locations has unique tiles that you can take that will either give you a unique special action or they're going to give you a basic resource of the location that you are currently at, which your mammoth can take back to your original arc to score you additional resources and, of course, net you some specific bonuses based on what they get. Uh, there's certain actions that are instant that will happen that your, that your mammoth might get. Maybe they're going to get um, something like the rain's going to hit or discarding cards, etc., etc. But for the most part, there's beneficial things for this. But when your mammoth utilizes those resources and brings them back, you'll be able to place them on these locations here on your mammoth board, which is going to, once you've covered them, give you beneficial uses like additional resources of a choice of your type, uh, arc stages, coins slash building points, etc., etc. So they all kind of have you gain certain net benefits to them. And uh, that's basically how your mammoth works. And those are the basic two actions of the game. Roll dice, move the mammoth, trade, or build and then trade. Those are the main aspects that you can do. Uh, whenever you want to trade, you can utilize the four to one, three to one, two to one, one to one area, and it's gonna cost you resources based on that requirement, and you'll move around the board in that way, and then once you get to one to one and you use that, it'll come back to the four to one. If you want, you can roll a die, 
trade a resource in and get whatever random die that is. And I believe it's gonna be only once a turn and then it'll move to the next space, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a main board for your upgrades. After you get a certain number of cargo trails or caravans, you'll be moving your marker down this track. And if you're the first person to reach the very end, you'll get a build point. And build points can be used to build arc stages. You can use a certain number of them to move the, um, track or I should say the water meter back down. There's a couple other things you can use those points for as well. And uh, that's it. After your turn, after you've done one of those two things, your turn is over and it'll pass the next player's turn and they'll roll their dice or they're going to build and then continue on. The game is going to end when you're able to build all of your arc stages along with building your animals. The moment you build your animals, that is the game over. The other way the game is going to end is if this little tracker gets all the way around the board, gets the gust, gust to, and then the final space, which no longer is, doesn't exist on the board, uh, that is going to end the game. When these guys move across the, when this guy moves across the board here, when the gust hits and the gust two hits, you're going to be flipping over tiles or like preventing them from being used. They're going to be flooded. They're going to give you a water and then nothing else is going to be able to be used from that location when, of course, it is rolled with these die here. It's kind of a way to make the board a little bit more uh, flooded throughout the game. Most likely not all the board will be flooded by the time the game is over, but it's something that's going to kind of slow certain players down based on where they played and based on where the dice have been rolled. Otherwise, though, that's the basic idea for the game The Flood. Okay, let's go ahead and discuss it. So as you guys might have guessed, this game is similar to Catan. This is the game that you've probably played before to some extent or you'll have that deja vu feeling when you're sitting here playing this game but with a lot of notable exceptions. Uh, first of all this is a biblical theme. It's one of my favorite aspects of the game. I really enjoy biblical themes that are made well with a lot of time and care and you can obviously see that this game took a lot of time effort and care into making what it is. The fact that you have your ark and your different caravans, your different huts and buildings, you can see that they're all built with love and tender care. I've also noticed too that there is the 3D prints, but there's also gonna be wooden ones that are gonna be your option on the Kickstarter. And actually, I prefer those personally more because I feel like it fits the aesthetic of the theme of the game. And of course, what it looks like kind of has an old school type feel. Uh, the artwork for the game. The art for this game is excellent, like super excellent. I really, really, really dig the main board, uh, the main box of this game, this cover. It shows you exactly what you're going to be doing by just looking at it, and it does it in a beautiful way. All the artwork is done really, really well. Even the main game board is really cool and how it's put together. It feels nice. It has extreme table presence. This is a game that you're going to walk by, look at, and be like, oh, what's going on here? And then, of course, once you see the theme, it's either going to probably turn you on or turn you off. I know some people are not a big fan of biblical theme games and maybe it has a certain thing to do with the type of games that you usually see with a biblical theme or maybe it's just uh, you're really into the stylized uh, biblical themes and you're looking for those really good ones that you can utilize for church or utilize for group ministry or teen ministry and that kind of thing and if so this might be something to take a look at here. Now uh, let's talk about gameplay because I've already mentioned all the quality as far as the components go, stylization, artwork, graphic design, it all works and all looks and all feels very very well done. Uh, the gameplay of the game. This is like Catan, but instead of just rolling the dice, uh, the, I think it's basically two dice for Catan, or it's it's two dice and then you check to see what locations. So you're going to be utilizing not only the double different resources and of course the tool, but there's going to be a wild that can give you kind of an advantage. There's these nasty cards that can be drawn, which they're not always nasty. Sometimes they're actually really good, but uh, they're kind of a randomized thing that can happen in the game. Uh, cards, I really like the idea of. It's kind of a nice countdown time it gives the game a bit of stress and tension and you don't know exactly when the game is going to end and you start to see this meter moving across the board and I really enjoy that. Uh, one thing I suggested to the designer, which I hopefully will they'll, they'll consider doing, is instead of just shuffling the deck and letting people draw, uh, making sure that the sins are separated in some way into the game so that the sins are going to be maybe a certain number in the top half and a certain number in the bottom half. So that you don't know exactly when the game is going to end, but it still has a certain amount of time. It's not going to make it all the sins on the bottom or all the sins on the top. There's no, it's, it shouldn't be randomized because that's really unfortunate when you set this whole game up and you go to play the first six rounds, seven rounds, you draw six or seven of these, these cards here and they're all sin and then the game is over and everyone loses before they can build their second arc stage. That's not super great. So that is a small fix that I think will make it up for it. And what I've done is I basically will shuffle in a certain number on the top stack and then a certain number in the middle and then a couple at the very bottom. So that way it kind of gives the game more of a flow. 
Um, uh, that being said, uh, the idea of your mammoth, another, another interesting thing that's very different from Catan, is you're going to get this little mammoth that's going to go onto your game board, it's going to move across the board, it's going to gather resources based on how far it can move, it will bring it back to the Ark. It's kind of like your nifty little helper. I like that. I think it would actually be even more valuable if you were able to have, if he was a little bit stronger, maybe you could carry additional resources quicker, um, because in general he's not going to be as like carefully used. I think as people, we play this game quite a few times now, and after they've played it the first time, they've always wanted to get that mammoth, but upon playing it, they're like, I don't really know if I want this mammoth. Like, it seems like it takes a lot of actions to get it going, and by that point in time, I'm behind in the game, and is it gonna give me enough to actually catch up? And I'm not too certain that it does, but maybe we were playing it wrong. I'm not, I'm not playing it wrong, but not playing it effectively, and that might be the case. I'm not too certain. Um, the different player boards, it's actually a really unique little idea to where you're not going to have to look for the same resources, so they're, they're not gonna have the same type of value which is kind of cool and each player is going to require different resources to get what they need as far as arc stages and these guys at the top here excellent idea really really enjoyed that the fact that your mammoth board is unique and presents different challenges as to what you need to get in order to acquire them and requires different tokens and give you different tokens and arc stages i enjoy that as well speaking of arc stages there's certain cards in the game that you'll be getting that'll give you bonus to arc stages and whatnot i feel like some of the cards are a little either too aggressive or or too nice uh some player gets to draw two cards and both of those cards are get a free arc stage that's ridiculously powerful whereas if another player is able to get like two sins it doesn't help them and it hurts them in fact so just a few of those small little changes in this deck is going to make all the difference um, I really enjoy the board's idea of moving across. It feels very Catan-esque, but with unique twists and turns. There's unique benefits and bonuses you can get based on what the die are rolled. I like the little tokens and how they present a nice little benefit when you're gathering them as well. And I also like the idea of this track here presenting you with the option of actually increasing your values of the different type of things that you own. The trades are really nice as well. The going from four to one to one to one, as long as you're willing to pay for it originally as a cost, is a cool idea. And the fact that it comes back also really, really dig. And then of course the die rolling one. I don't mind that one, but it has to be once per turn or maybe you can only trade once per turn. I don't know how it has to work, but it can't go back and forth. Otherwise that's an infinite kind of loop to get exactly what you need and it's kind of a time waster. So I think that's also been changed, but just another note as far as the game goes. <laughs> Um, but overall, in general, I know I have uh, little nitpicks here and there because I, I, I see this game as being really, really powerful, really strong, uh, unique variant to a game that's kind of a classic style Catan game with tons of diversity as far as the change goes to the different types of actions and maneuvers and planning that you can do. I love the mammoth theme. I love the cards. I really, really dig building my arc and it feels very good. It feels very tense. There's just things that need to be just tweaked and turned just a little bit. And I've seen it being done. Done. So I would just strongly suggest you take a look at the Kickstarter and see exactly what has been changed or what has been added and whether it's something you're going to enjoy. This is something we played on our live stream uh, this, this coming Sunday or this Sunday, depending on when you watch this video. And uh, people had a blast playing this game. They really, really enjoyed it. It was tension. It was filling up. The the, the, the gust was going around. You're seeing the, the, the tension of this tracker here, as well as the players were getting more resources. And when that happened, people wanted to trade with less with those players and back and forth, et cetera, et cetera. So the tension is there. The theming is there. The stylization. It's, it's all really, really well done. I highly suspect this game to fund and fund very well because you could see the amount of effort and time put into this game. And I know that just the few tiny little tweaks, this game is going to be great. And because this is a prototype, uh, I, I suspect there's going to be changes in general. I've already seen them. So just give those uh, some notes uh, or, or think, you know, some food for thought. Is this a game I would check out on Kickstarter? Absolutely. This is one that I strongly suggest you take a look at if you're interested in a biblical themed game with a classic modern board game twist, The Flood by Bedouin Games. It's going to be really, really good. And I had a good time playing it and so did everybody else playing the game just as it is. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game The Flood by Bedouin Games. If you're interested in taking a look at the game, there's a link down below which will be on Kickstarter on the 3rd, which means if you're watching this now, it's most likely up or it'll be up tomorrow. As well as go to our website, unfilteredgamer.com. Blog, blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more. You can check out our live stream every Sunday at 6 to 3 p.m. PS2. We we'll play games just like this one. And in fact, we did play this one. I'll have this uploaded on YouTube with some cuts and edits as well so you can see how the game is played. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to avoiding the flood with you next time.
Also, the mercy card should be called Grace. 